can be seated. And please turn your Bibles to John chapter 1, verse 1. Last week, we were you know, going through our study in the book of Exodus. We go verse by verse through the books of the Bible, and we're in the, the books of the law, Exodus, learning the law of God. And today is Christmas Eve 2023, and 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to make it so we could be saved. That's really the title of today, is Jesus came with the mission to save us from sin. And although most people know that, if, if you were to go out and say, yeah, 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 he did that, what we're going to try and do in our study today is let it really sink in. Because we can, we can hear the words, yeah, Jesus came to die for the sins of the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We, you know, everybody hears that. People hold signs, John 3.16 at football stadiums and stuff. And people might go home and read it or check it on their phones. And they just don't let it sink in. And so for all of us that know those, those things to be true, let's let it sink in today. And if, you, if you've heard it but you, it's not personalized to you, Today, our challenge would be, you've got to make it personal. Jesus came to have a relationship with us, and most people reject that desire for a relationship. And we're going to see uh, today, by going through the Gospels, you know, there's, most people say that there's two of the main Gospels tell the Christmas story, but we're starting with John, which also has a Christmas story. And you, you might say, no, he doesn't. <laughs> But there is a verse that we're going to see that actually has John's contribution uh, to the Christmas story. And so we're starting out in verse 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And so go to verse 14, because it's important before we read any more. What's this Word? You know, there's the Word and there's He. So the Word is a He. But then when you get down to verse 14, it defines who it is. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem, the word became flesh. Christmas story in the book of John. That God himself, and, and then you go back to verse 1, it says, in the beginning was, okay, so now, let's, now that we know word equals Jesus, who became flesh, in the beginning was Jesus. Jesus was with God. Jesus was God. He was in the beginning with God. Jesus was in the beginning with God. And people debate the de deity of Jesus. I don't know how you can, because it's so clear here. The Word became flesh. The Word was God. The Word was with God. So God himself so loved his creation that had been deceived by Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden causing Adam and Eve to rebel against God, bring sin into the world, and in bringing sin brought death and all the destruction and misery that we experience in the world for the last 6,000 years into the world. And God so loved us, he, he made a way for man to get out of that corrupted, sinful world. And he sent Jesus to make, it, make a way for that to happen. And man couldn't fix it, because what we inherited from Adam and Eve is we inherited their rebellion. We didn't inherit their sin, as many people say, because you have to sin against God to be a sinner. But we inherit rebellion. And all of, all of you that have had children, you know that that rebellion is right there, right at the beginning with your children. They don't want to listen to a thing you say. They only do if they want to. They, you tell them no, they want to say yes. And you, you know, on and on, to their own hurt. Have you ever noticed to their own hurt? You know, telling my son, he was, we, he was just a toddler and we were visiting one of his mom. That, you know, don't touch the stove, don't touch the stove. And, you know, to their own hurt. And God tells us, don't reject Jesus, don't reject Jesus. And people go their whole life and they reject Jesus. To, to their own hurt. And it's worse than getting your fingers burned on a, on a stove. It's for all of eternity. And so God so loved us, he sent Jesus, who is the only one. Verse 3, going back to verse 3, it says, All things were made through him. Jesus was the creative force of making all things. Without him, Jesus, nothing was made that was made. In him, Jesus before the manger. See, this is the son of God before the manger that poured himself into a body 2,000 years ago. In Jesus was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. 
Why? Because it, it goes, John goes on to say, why did the world not understand it? Why does the world today mostly still not get Jesus? Because men love darkness rather than light. That's what the Bible says. Oh, if I, if I gave my life to Jesus, I wouldn't be able to get high during Christmas and during the football games and stuff like that. I mean, <laughs> no, forget that. Oh, no, I'd have to actually give my life to him and let him control my life. Well, I'm in charge of my life, and I've still got that rebellion that I inherited from Adam and Eve, and I want to do my own thing, and nobody tells me what to do. There's things in this Bible that I don't agree with. And so who's God to say, oh, who's God to say he's God? <laughs> you have to be really deceived by the devil, Satan, to not understand we're not God. That there's a creation and it was breathed into existence by an all-powerful Jesus before the manger who just spoke the word and everything happened. And his laws are good. They're intended for us to enjoy life, enjoy loving one another, enjoy loving him, our creator. But he, and he lets us tap, if we, if we hate the darkness, instead of wanting to live in the darkness, you know, if you have been in a dark place and you wish somebody would turn on the light, see, there's a spiritual reality to that too. You can either be a cockroach that hates the light going on, you know, they scurry. Or, or we can be somebody, lie, you know, I'll hold the light. I can now see where I'm going. And I want to go to the light. I want to embrace the light. Jesus is the light. He's, I want to embrace him and give my life to him instead of getting away from the light. But people love the lust-filled darkness of the world for the most part. Jesus said it would be just few that would find him. And then going to verse 9, it says that, meaning Jesus, Jesus was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He, Jesus, was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own. Who did he come to? His own? Who were the own he's talking about? He's talking to the Jews. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. And this is so important, underline it, memorize it. But as many as received him, to them he, Jesus, gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. That, that is like beyond comprehension. You know, I mean, that is just, if people really meditated on that, the world would change. It, the Jews rejected him. Why? Why did the Jews reject him? For those that have really studied the Bible, it's, it's kind of, we can empathize with them a little bit. They were in misery. They were the chosen people. They had a temple. They had their laws. They had their religion. And the Romans were messing with it. Romans were enslaving them. Mur Romans were murdering them, keeping them from doing their religious stuff the way they wanted to. And by golly, these prophets of old talk about a Messiah who comes and sets up his kingdom, gets rid of all the enemies of Israel, lets us do what we want to do. And so we're waiting for him. We want our Messiah to come. And Jesus comes, flips over the table of the religious stuff, and they go, he's not it. Oh, if you don't believe in me, you'll die in your sins. We don't really care about our sins. Why don't you get rid of the Romans, and then we can have some worship here. We, don't, we want to reject you. So in other words, he came to his own, and they rejected him because he wasn't the Jesus they wanted. Instead of the, one, the Jesus that God so loved the world, he sent, because the problem is those, all those scribes, Pharisees, Jews that were wanting a conquering Messiah before his time came for being a conquering Messiah, they were all in sin. So if he sets up a kingdom and the kingdom has to be sinless, then how many of them get to join the kingdom? Zippo. And so God said, I'm coming to deal with sin first so there can be somebody in the kingdom. And you know, if, we, if our sin... If our sin, my sin, your sin, doesn't get dealt with, let, you know, perfectly clear. If your sin doesn't get dealt with, you don't get to go to heaven. That's what Jesus said. And so he sent God, Jesus, the God-man Jesus, so he could deal with our sin. Most people don't want to even admit their sin. Or they think that their sin is not as bad as the neighbor next door, so God certainly is going to let me in. No, it's not, it's not going to happen. It, we have to embrace the only way to be saved from sin, and, it, and it's Jesus. And if it is Jesus, then as, as many as received him, to them, 
to all of you that receive him, gave he the right to become the children of God. Do, do we have rights guaranteed by man here on earth? Yeah, Constitution, yeah. Bill of, Bill of what? Bill of rights. And those are all locked in concrete. They'll never change, right? <laughs> man takes away man rights. Uh, you know what? When God says, I give you a right, you know, the, people can say, what kind of rights do we have? Only one. You only have one right. And that right is to be declared a child, of God, a child of God by God himself, if you put your trust in Jesus. So that it's a right that comes with a requirement. You have to put your trust in Jesus. You have to receive him as a savior. Then you have a right promised by God who never lies and never, gives, you know, never goes back on his promises. You know, they'll take our gun rights, they'll take our freedom of speech rights, the right to vote, the right to this, the right to that. All that's going to go away. It's all going to be destroyed because it was made by man. But this right was given to us by God in, in his word. So, have you received him? Because if you don't, you know, if you've received him, you have a right to be called a child of God, to become a child of God. People will say, oh, we're all children of God, not according to the Bible. According to the Bible, those people who have not received the biblical Jesus, see, we have to believe in the biblical Jesus. He came not to conquer, not to make me have a better life, not to give me a better job, not to give me... He didn't come for any of those reasons that a lot of people follow Jesus for a while. He came to give us salvation through faith in him, to wipe away our sin. That's what he came to do. And so if we don't have the sin problem figured out, then we, the rest of it is meaningless. Who, th those who believe in his name, who were born not of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. In John chapter 3, Jesus explains to Nicodemus, a very religious man, a very religious Jew, and, and Nicodemus comes to him at night and says, man, you're pretty awesome. You know, so the stuff you're doing, people couldn't do unless it came from God. And Jesus didn't say, yeah, you're right. You want to, you know, you want to befriend me on Facebook or something? He, he, just said, he just said, Nicodemus, you got to be born again. So according to John chapter 1, what's he saying? you got to be born again, Nicodemus. You know what that means? You have to be, you have to receive me as a savior and then you have the right to become the child of God who will be born, not of any, any born of the flesh, born of blood, will of the flesh, but of God. You've got to be born again of God. And, you know, I'm a few months away from my 50-year birthday. I mean, spiritual, for those of you that think I'm looking pretty rotten for 50. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> 50 years ago, total pagan living in sin, rebellion against God, and all of a sudden I realized, what am I doing? And then that night, I became born again. Something changed. It was real. It was something that, of God that came inside and possessed me, as he promises to do. He pr promises to come inside. Born again. And the word Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us. Again, the Christmas story. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You know what grace means? Unmerited favor. It means receiving something you don't deserve. Do we deserve heaven? No. Do we deserve to be forgiven for all the times we've used God's name in vain, rebelled, stolen from people, hated people, um, rebelled against him, all the sins that God says, don't do these, and we do them because we're rebellious, because that's the way we are, that's the way we were born. Do we deserve to be forgiven for any of those things? No. And, and so then if he just forgives us without dealing with the penalty for those sins, then how just is he? You know, there was a, uh, I think it was the governor of Louisiana, was it? He, he uh, just pardoned a bunch of murders in Louisiana. And on his way out, I think it was Louisiana. Forgive me, Louisiana, if I got the wrong state. Um, but it just happened this last week. And what would, what would all the victims of the murders be thinking? No justice. I mean, how could this have happened? Well, why should we be forgiven for anything by the God that we've sinned against? There's no justice. You know, if we just pardon us, there's no justice unless somebody is willing to come along and take the penalty for all of our sins and pay for it all on the cross. That's what Jesus did for us. So 
So God can give us something that we don't deserve because Jesus came to take what we did deserve, which is <laughs> death and separation from God. He, he took that on himself so that we could get his righteousness. He gave us his righteousness so that God sees the righteousness of his son in us when we receive Jesus. So then he looks at us and says, oh, you're a child of God. Verse 16, go to verse 16. And of his, Jesus' fullness, we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, which we've been studying in our Exodus study for the last several weeks. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You know, the Jews actually at, at Mount Sinai, we've already covered this in our study, Moses went up and heard from God. God says, tell them, this is what I'm going to tell them to do. All the do's and all the don'ts. And the people go, no problem, we're going to do it. And then immediately they're rebelling against God. They're rebe immediately not doing. And so the law came by Moses and Galatians, Paul the apostle wrote in Galatians, the reason for the law really was to reflect who God is and to show us we're not God and we're not capable of doing what God has told us to do. It's a schoolmaster to make us realize we're lost in our trespasses and sins. We're headed to hell. We're, headed, we're in rebellion and we've all sinned against God. And he made a way for us to then come to Jesus when we realize I, I can't make it. I can't make it on my own. Oh, good, finally, you figured it out. Well, what's the solution? Faith in my son, Jesus Christ. Receive him and you can have everlasting life. Receive him and I'll take your sins away. And I'll do justice because Jesus shed his blood even for your sins. You know, your sins all were part of the blood shedding of Jesus. He paid for the sins of the whole world, but the only people that get to enjoy the results of that are those who put their trust in him. Those who receive him, everybody else left a winning lotto ticket on the table. And it wasn't just millions or billions of dollars, it was eternal life. I want to leave it on the table because who's going to tell me what to do with my life? Better let Jesus do it. Better let Jesus tell you what to do with your life. He says, believe in me and I'll give you everlasting life. But grace came through Jesus. Let's turn to Luke chapter 1, verse 26. So, God brought the first covenant. There's really two covenants. And I know for all the theologians here, Kevin, there's more than that. There's a Davidic covenant. There's Abrahamic covenant. There's this covenant. But there's really only two covenants that everybody in this planet is under. They're either under the covenant of the law, and not because they've studied the law of God or anything else. That's The law is that we've been created. We answer to God. And these are his laws. Thou shalt and thou shalt not. And if you're not going to do them, you're going to die in your sins. And then there's the other covenant, the covenant of grace. The covenant of grace and truth through Jesus Christ. The covenant of forgiveness that only comes through Jesus Christ. So everybody that rejects Jesus is living under the law. And the law, whether they agree with it or not, is going to judge them on judgment day. Because it says in Revelation chapter 20, it says the books were open. And the book of the works of the people that rejected Jesus are open. And if their name wasn't written in the book of life because they had never received Jesus, never received Jesus, your name's not written in the book of life. And so then these books are all the works. And then God's going to say, remember when you did this and this and this and this? And, well, I didn't really understand. Yes, you did, because I gave you a conscience. The first time you stole, did you think that there was something wrong with stealing from people? I did. I was a total pagan. Didn't even believe there was a God or a Satan. Thought I believed in reincarnation. But when I was stealing, man, why did I do that? And then when somebody stole from me, I definitely knew it was wrong. I mean, I really, I knew at that moment in the strongest way that that was wrong. <laughs> the same thing with adultery. Same thing with murder. Same thing with, you know, cursing your parents. You can do it easily when you're a kid. It's really, you don't want to tolerate it when you're an adult and you're a parent. 
See, we know all these things. See, God, whether we acknowledge his law or not, it really is inside of here. It, it just, it's what's crying out, just get right with God. There's, why are you feeling? You, a mutated amoeba doesn't decide these things are wicked. When it grows into a man, you know, evolution supposedly, no, we are created by God. And he put a conscience in us. And then we have the written word that tells us. So we want to be under the new covenant, which is the new covenant of grace, which we're going to close our service with. But in Luke, this is a famous Christmas story. Angel Gabriel informs virgin named Mary that she's going to conceive. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. Now, this is really important. Call his name Jesus. That's what the angel tells Mary. Later on, an angel, maybe Gabriel, we don't know, an angel tells Joseph, you will call his name Jesus because he will save people from their sins. And we're going to look at more when we see that later on. But uh, the, so house of David, see, Mary had to be the, the woman chosen to fulfill prophecy. There was a prophecy that a virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and he will be called Emmanuel. You know, Isaiah, 700 years before Mary. Prophecy, God, a virgin is going to conceive. And when he grows up, he'll be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Which goes back to John, people that, again, deny the deity of Jesus, the Jehovah Witnesses, the Mormons, all those people that deny, under inspiration of Satan, deny the deity of Jesus. Uh, God himself prophesied that this Messiah who would be born to a virgin would be God with us. And we'll see that in a minute, that verse. But, but see, God had promised David in the Davidic, king, you know, Davidic covenant he said, you know, I promised Abraham that, it's, that the Messiah is going to be a descendant of Abraham. Oh, and then I promised Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. I promised Jacob that it's going to be one of his sons, Judah. It was going to be the Messiah is going to come through Judah. Then I promised to King David that it's going, the Messiah is actually going to come through the line of King David and then later through Solomon. And so then here, so God, in picking a Messiah, 483 years after a commandment is made by the Persians to go and rebuild Jerusalem, a Messiah has to come, and it has to come at a place where he's going to be born in Bethlehem, and it has to be to a woman who's from the tribe of, uh, from a, a lineage of David. People of, st st statisticians have looked at, what was the population of Israel at the time, what what is the chance of all those prophecies coming true? Zippo. It's, it, it could only have, it's statistically not a coincidence that this could happen. And God had already seen it was going to happen, put these prophecies in the Bible, so while Satan is telling us, oh, you know, there's not really a God, these aren't really prophecies, Duh, don't listen to God, don't read the Bible, all this other stuff, and go, wait a second. The, these things were there in the Old Testament before Jesus came. They didn't add it afterwards. The, this has to be God-breathed. This has to have been God who knows all things from the beginning to the end. He's already seen history. He writes it into his word so that we can know he's telling us the truth and all the world is lying to us. Does the world just lie to us all the time? You know, how about the whole COVID thing? How many people think that, how many people still think everything, Fauci and the government, and the Center of Disease Control and the World Health Organization, everything they told us was right on. Okay, good. Not totally deceived people here. <laughs> See, and imagine that. The whole world was believing them, though. How, how is she? The World Health Organization, these, these brainiacs are just telling us all oh, these things. We just got to do what they do because they know. Liars. People are liars. 
when God tells us something, he tells us, he tells us before it happens so that we'll put our trust in him. He doesn't lie, and he knows what's going on. Wouldn't we rather put our trust in God who tells us what's going to happen to our soul, whether it's going to be heaven or hell, and then believe what he tells us about how it is to avoid hell and go to heaven with him forever? So, um, he will be great, verse 32. He's, um, and this isn't like MVP status. This is like, <laughs> this is MVP for the entire universe forever. I mean, <laughs> this is like great. You have to put down like exclamation mark. He will be great. He will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. To fulfill the promise that God made to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, the Davidic covenant that I talked to. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and, his king, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Ultimately, and see here again, the Jews are back in the land because God predicted it. After 2,000 years of being scattered through all the nations of the world, God said in Ezekiel 36, 37, land, get ready, because I'm bringing my Jews back. And the Jews coming back are going to be as if a graveyard full of dead, dry bones comes alive and goes back into the land. Did that happen? And then the whole world's going to be against them. Is that happening? And God's going to preserve them. And then when Jesus returns, which we'll cover in detail next week, we'll cover some of the prophecies, when he returns, it's going to be Jews in Jerusalem being attacked by the Antichrist army to annihilate them, and God puts a stop to it, sets up his kingdom as all the Jews that are still alive, which is only going to be one-third of what's around today, according to biblical prophecy, real tragedy. But one-third of them, it says, they will look on him whom they have pierced and weep and wail. And, and then he's going to set up his kingdom. With those Jews and a bunch of Gentiles that get to come to, according to Matthew 25, under certain conditions, and the world's going to have a 1,000-year kingdom with King Jesus reigning in Jerusalem. And you know what happens then? Then Satan's let out of the pit, and a lot of those people that had children and children, children's great, you know, through that 1,000 years, they're going to rebel against God. They're going to rebel against Jesus sitting in Jerusalem. And then he's going to say, okay, you had your chance. You, you lived under perfect bliss in the kingdom. All you had is still that rebellious spirit, and Satan comes out of the pit, gets your rebellion going. You turned against me, and so those people get judged. Everybody that wanted to let King Jesus still be Jesus, then they get to come into the eternal kingdom. So right here, it says, son of the highest, his kingdom will never be an end. When Jesus comes back, he sets up his earthly kingdom for a thousand years, his heavenly kingdom forever and ever. Just what's prophesied here. Which side do we want to be on? I've made my choice, because <laughs> how could you not? Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be, since I do not know a man? Uh, virgins never had a child without knowing a man. Never happened since. But in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, it says this. The prophet Isaiah came to a king of Judah who was, who was being attacked and was certain that the invading armies of the northern 10 tribes of Israel along with Syria were going to kill him. And if they killed him and came into Jerusalem, they would also wipe out the royal line and the promises of God to David would not be fulfilled. The Davidic line, the Davidic dynasty would have been destroyed. And what God said to the prophet Isaiah, go tell this king, that therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Don't worry. I'm, my promises of a Messiah coming through Judah, including you, rotten king, because he was a rotten king. <laughs> I, I, could, I should just let them judge you. I should let the northern king of Israel and the Syrians, I should let them kill you for as wicked as you are. But I made a promise. And before you even, the, a Messiah is going to come through you. He's going to be born of a virgin hundreds of years later. That's my sign. I'll keep my promise. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit, this, you know, will come upon you 
And the power of the highest, God the Father, you know, just the Holy Spirit, Father, will overshadow this woman. You, therefore, also, you, therefore, also, that Holy One who is to be born, Holy One. What is a Holy One? <laughs> Holiness of God, who is to be born with you, will be called the Son of God. And which is what we call Jesus to this day, the Son of God, Son of David. Fully God, fully man, is what the theologians say. You put the whole Bible together, Jesus was fully man, and he was fully God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren, because she was too old to have children. So if God can cause somebody too old to have a child, can he cause a virgin to have a child? Of course, for with God, nothing is impossible. Isn't that nice to know that with God who created the universe, with the breath of his mouth, that nothing's impossible? And, now, and it has to be that big of a God to you to understand he can also forgive you of sin. Wow. It's, nothing's too impossible. God can forgive us of sin and let us into his kingdom, give us a new heart to follow him and desire him, even though we were rebellious against him and rejecting him. That's, phew, that's a miracle. Go to Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. The other Christmas story out of Matthew. And Matthew at first gives the lineage of Jesus all the way from Abraham to Joseph. Now, why did Joseph? Well, because God had promised David that through Solomon, the Messiah would come. Well, Mary wasn't a descendant of Solomon. But Joseph was. So Mary was blood Davidic, but the, the right of the throne goes through the man. And so then Joseph was the adopted father, and so in an adoptive way, he, is, he has the right of giving the throne to Jesus. And it actually, and that's the miraculous way that God bypassed a curse upon the Solomonic line in the Old Testament. So and only through a virgin birth could his adoption put Jesus in the place to have the throne of David, throne of Solomon, in history. So, I mean, it's, we could spend a lot of time on that, but we're not going to. <laughs> oh, but that was enough. So, now the birth of Jesus Christ was followed after his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph before they came together. Betrothed in their culture contractually obligated, Mary was contractually obligated to become Joseph's wife. But before they came together, before they had any sexual relations, and there was a time, the time where they could come together, consummate the marriage, and be husband and wife instead of betrothed was determined by the man's father. He would decide, yeah, you got a job, you got a house, you know how to do this, you can, you can, now you can go get married. Now you can go have the, the wedding of the, of the bride and the groom. So before that happens, so she is contractually obligated to keep herself pure, not chase any other guys, do nothing, and because she is now supposed to be Joseph's and wife in the future. But she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. She was showing uh, so about three months after Gabriel comes to her, she's now found to be with child. She's showing. And, and really think about this. <laughs> Mary gets told by the Gabriel, you know, you're going to conceive by the Holy One of God. Is that something you're going to go home and tell mom and dad about? I mean, we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But if you were to say, hey, an angel met with me today and I'm actually going to have a child... And it's going to be, actually, the Holy Spirit and the Father are just going to come together and they're going to conceive life in my womb. And, uh, and by the way, they found out in 2016 that when, uh, when the sperm gets to the egg, when the, out of the millions that are after it, when the one gets there, instantly there's a flash of light. Did you know that? They just found this out. There, there's, the, there's a light of life that happens, and they attribute it to... The, the way God created everything, and all those millions after it, and then one of them gets through and it lights off this zinc chemical reaction that emits light. And so there's life, light, 
when that <laughs> happens. And so you don't get to feel it, <laughs> but can you imagine as she's sitting there realizing, okay, a month goes by, two months, uh, I wonder if I should tell anybody now. I, I, nobody's going <laughs> to believe you. And when, when they see a baby bump, they go, ah, you're betrothed to Joseph, right? Joseph, have you? No. Um, what's, what happened? And she would say, well, this is what happened. An angel came to me. Can you imagine? I mean, again, we weren't there. Bible doesn't say it. But I can imagine it was difficult. In fact, I think it was so difficult, that was the rumor, because... The scribes and Pharisees later on said, we weren't born of fornication. Why? Because that's what they were saying. You know, the, forget this virgin birth stuff. She, she fornicated, is what they were accusing Jesus of being an offspring of fornication. Bound with child, let it sink in. Um, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. What does being a just man mean? He was a man of the law. He, he was a man, God said it, I want to do it, I want to believe it. He was probably an orthodox kind of Jew, wanted to do what God said to do. And what does the law say? In Deuteronomy 23, 23, um, your notes have it, and, you know, we won't take the time to turn there. This is what it says. This is the law of God. This is what Joseph would have been aware of. And it says, if a young woman who is a virgin is betrothed to a husband, marry Joseph. If this is the case, and a man finds her in the city and lies with her, then you shall bring them both out to the gate of that city, and you shall stone them to death with stones. The young woman, because she did not cry out in the city, and the man, because he humbled his neighbor's wife, so you shall put away the evil from among you. Wow. That's, you know, and why did God have that Allah? Because God knows as he created women and he created men, he knows the best way to enjoy peace and joy and have a fruitful relationship in your family into the future is to say, to stay virgin until marry, married, heterosexual, monogamous until death you depart. He knows that. And what do you think Satan's saying to do? Don't do that. <laughs> Rebel against that. I don't want to do it. And, and look at all the destruction that's come to families. Your family's my family. You know, not Juanita's my family. But I mean, the families, you know, I grew up with just unfaithfulness between my, my mom and dad. I didn't find out until later on. Divorce, all this other stuff that happens in life that destroys families. But you know what? Maybe you, maybe you have had your life ruined by things against the law of God. Maybe you've ruined things by your sinfulness against people. Uh, aren't, you, aren't you glad that today we're remembering Jesus came to take away our sins? See, that's the thing is, as soon as we realize we sin, we can be, I don't want to, you're condemning me. No, <laughs> I, I'm convicting you that you need to run to Jesus for a savior. You need to run and let God save you from sin because it's important. So, so he would have said, man, this is what I'm supposed to do. Because, And see, it later, the law goes on to say, but if it was in the country, it was out in the, out in the woods that some man um, accosts a woman and lies with her, then, then you just kill him. Because she could have been crying out. And if she was crying out, nobody helped her. It's not her fault. So the law protects the women. But if it was in the city, the woman was obligated to yell, raise, rape me, rape me. And what would the men have obli been obligated to do? To go and get them and kill them. And that's why we can know that the scribes and Pharisees were totally corrupt. Because what did they do when caught in the act of adultery? They only brought the woman to Jesus. Because according to the rules of adultery, same thing. She was supposed to cry out. And she didn't. She was part of it, caught in the very act. So, and the man was also responsible, and so he should have been there too. Matthew 1.19, and not wanting to make her a public example, he was minded to put her away secretly. And it might have been because Mary told her, you know, Joseph, really, I mean, you know me. God didn't go to a, 
he didn't go to a loose woman to have Jesus the Messiah born. Uh, Joseph, you know me. I'm a woman of the word. I'm, I'm a woman of the law. I, I want to be in living in holiness to God. I'm telling you, I was visited by an angel. And he told me that this was going to happen. I have been faithful to you as a wife, betrothed wife. Must have been torn. Verse 20. While he thought about these things, maybe Mary sharing what I just said, behold, an angel Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, jo Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take you, Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he will save his people from their sins, and his people means you and me and everybody through history who believe, if you believe. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet Isaiah that we read, saying, behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Prophecy. Verse 21 again, he shall call his name Jesus. So, Turn to Leviticus chapter 18, verse 4, as we wrap up here. Because this is really the crux of what the study title is. Jesus came with a mission to save us. And in our culture, Jesus just means, yeah, Jesus. To most people, it's a swear word. To us, it's a precious, na precious name of our Savior. But in, in the Hebrew, it's Yeshua. And Yeshua means God saves. That's what the word means. And so at first, Mary was told, you'll name him Jesus. Joseph was told, You'll, marry, you'll name him Jesus because he will save people from their sins because his name means God saves. Who else saves? No one else saves. No, no one else can save us from sin. There is, no, there is no second choice savior. There's no second choice savior plan by God because it's only God himself that can save us from sin and God did it once through his son Jesus. So once again, the law was sent to show us how sinful we are. That's what the purpose was. Show how holy God is, how sinful we are. Everybody that understands law of God through the conscience or through the written word has a choice. I'm either going to take my chance with God because if, he's, if he isn't going to let a good person like me in, then forget him. I've had many people tell me that. If you, if you die today, where are you going to go? Well, heaven. Why? Because I'm a good person. Well, how do you know you're good enough? Well, I, I don't hate anybody. I, I was actually recently asked the question of somebody in jail. <laughs> and I said, I said, if you die, where are you going to go? Well, I hope heaven. And by the way, if you say you, in your mind, if you were to answer the question, well, I, I hope so, then you're not there. Because what you're saying is, I hope God will keep his promises, and that means you don't really understand. So then I asked you know, the others too, I said, so then, okay, so you do die, and you're at the pearly gates, and there's a gatekeeper, and he says, well, why should I let you in? What are you going to say? Well, I, because, you know, I love people. I, I don't ever do anything. <laughs> I'm thinking, well, you're here, so I mean, somehow you missed out on, <laughs> you missed out on a little bit of love here <laughs> somewhere. But see how it just shows you how self-deceived we can be. I, I mean, you can, because Satan wants us to, he's constantly, you're okay, you're okay. He's, he's like the doctor that's looking at your MRI and, oh man, this guy is messed up and he's got cancer riddled in his body. Doc, what do you see? Nothing. I don't see anything. You're fine. Just go live your life. Uh, they'd be sued for malpractice. But see, that's how Satan is. 
He doesn't care about being sued for malpractice. He knows he's going to the pit of hell. He knows he's going to the lake of fire forever, but he's a rebel and he's taught us how to rebel and he still really thinks he can be God. He really thinks he can be God. Oh, you know, look, I've got all these tunnels. I've got all these things for Hamas. I am going to destroy your Jews. I don't care that your Bible says that though all the nations of the world are gathered against it, still you're going to stick around. How's that working out for Hamas? They thought it was a done deal. And you know what? The Iranian president, every week, said it again this week, very soon Israel is going to be gone. You know what? If it wasn't for me knowing this Bible, knowing the God of the Bible, I'd put all my chips on Iran. I'd hawk the house, the car, my wife, grandchildren. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> I just like, how can you lose? But because I know this, I'm putting all my chips on the Jews. I know they're going to be severely hurt because his word says so. But they're going to survive. And it's going to be a horrible war that's coming that we'll talk about next week. So going to Leviticus, this is what the law says. The law says, in Leviticus 18.4, kind of wrapping up all the law, you shall observe my judgments and keep my ordinances to walk in them. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. Okay, so I ask you, are you going to go to heaven? Yeah, because I'm a good person. That's the standard, everything he's ever said. Any hands up? Okay, so that's Moses came, by Moses came the law. By Jesus came grace and truth. Which one do we want? Because Romans 3.23 says, this is the word of God that says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Are you part of all? And if you're truthful with yourself, yes, Kevin, I have sinned against God. Not biggies, just little ones. And yeah, I use Jesus' name in vain. How often do you have to do that before you violated the fourth commandment? Just once, or third commandment. Yeah, just once, I've sinned against God. How do you erase that? How do you undo what you have just done in using his name in vain? You can't, you can't. Somebody has to come and save you. And that somebody was Jesus, who was sent 2,000 years ago into the world to take all the sins that we deserve upon himself and then die for it so we can have life. And, and Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death, and it's not talking just human death, it's talking about eternally separated from God. What we get as a paycheck for sinning against God without being fixed is death. Separation from God in a place called hell. But the gift, a gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, a lot of, a lot of gifts are going to be exchanged in the next day, a couple days. Nothing compares to the gift of God. And most of this world will give it not even a second thought. They don't even care. But you care, right? And if you haven't cared, you should care. Because there's nothing more important than receiving that gift. And that gift only comes by receiving him as your Savior. John 8, 23. John 8, 23. And he said to them, unbelieving scribes and Pharisees, this is Jesus, speaking to the unbelieving scribes and Pharisees who thought they were observants of the law and they were going to go to heaven. And this Jesus was messing with them and needed to be eliminated off of the earth. You are from beneath. You've been deceived by Satan. I am from above. I came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross, the cross to the grave, and the grave to the sky. You were of this world. The world system is owned by Satan, which is be somebody, be religious, be into the lust and pleasure of the world. Do anything except put your trust in Jesus. You were of this world. I am not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, the sent, promised, sent Messiah, Savior of the world, God with us, believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Then they said to him, who are you? <laughs> and Jesus said to them, just what I have been saying to you from the beginning. I'm here to save people from sins. 
I raise the dead, walk on water, open the eyes of the blind, let the lame walk, you know, make bread out of nothing, make fish out of nothing, all to show you that I to save people from sins. He didn't come to do all those things, to do, just do miracles and give people free food and everything. He did it to prove to his generation, I'm the God man. I'm the fulfillment of Isaiah. I'm the fulfillment of, of several Psalms. I am the fulfillment of uh, being the order of Melchizedek and priesthood. I'm the new priest. I'm the savior. I am everything because I've done all these things. And they go, oh no, you're doing it by the power of Satan is what they said because they didn't want to surrender their lives to him. And people today have all kinds of excuses for why they don't want to give their lives to Jesus, but they're all lame old excuses. Let's finish in Jeremiah 31, 31, the new covenant. 2,600 years before Jesus. But this is the covenant new covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, after the days of 1,500 years of living under the law. So Jeremiah, the prophet, speaking to the Jews and Judah, soon to be destroyed by the Babylonians. You know, God's judgment's coming upon the Jews because they violated the law of God, worshiping idols, sacrificing their children, all this other stuff. And so this law thing, you know, Jeremiah is basically saying, God's saying, this law thing's not working out too good for you guys. So I'm going to make a new covenant. I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds. I will, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. Why? For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. So here's a new covenant. I'm going to make it so all they have to do is say, God, forgive me, a sinner. Will you possess me? Will you, instead of me just saying, here's what the law says from a distance, okay, I'll do it as long as I don't decide to not do it, and then I just hope I don't get caught. That's how I was. I only cared about laws if I wasn't going to get caught or wasn't going to mess with my life. But when we get possessed by Jesus, because he says, if you just say, let me do open heart surgery on you, and I want want you to change it so... I do what you want me. I want to do what you tell me to do. I want to stop my rebellion that I earned from the Garden of Eden. I I want to turn away from the poison of listening to Satan that I will be like God, knowing what's good and evil. I want your law to change me, but you've got to help me. And all of a sudden, he comes in and he does it. And and people, Kevin, don't you want to drink with us? No, why? I've already had all I want. Well, when did you drink? I don't know. (laughs) Many years ago. (laughs) See, a Christian, like, it's all that I want because I've got Jesus and I don't need the the loss of life and pleasures and stuff. We're destroying my life, destroying my family's life. I want to, and when I do fall into sin because I do still get deceived and want to do something God tells me to do, I now run to God and go, Oh, Jesus, I'm so thankful you died for that too. I get to go to heaven. You've got you to deal with that artery that's still messed up in my heart. You've got you to put a stint in or something. <laughs> you know, going with Juanita having her stint put in recently to save her life. Uh, God puts a stint in our lives, in our spiritual lives, to to fix us, to get us going until we get a new body that's not going to be tempted anymore. I said we'd stop at Jeremiah, but Romans, this is what it takes. If anybody here has never given your life to Jesus, then this this is what Paul says. But what does it say? Romans 10, 8. The word is near you. It's in your mouth. How hard is it to get saved? This is how hard it is. It's right here in my mouth. And all I have to do is what I did almost 50 years ago. Told the people that were telling me what I'm telling you. Why don't you just confess you're a sinner 
and you want to get off of the throne of your life because it's not, you're not very good at being God of your life, and tell God you want him to be on the throne of your life, and you want to just surrender and just let him take charge. He's not going to tell you what's going to happen in your life. I had no idea what was going to happen. But I knew all I needed to know is God is good. I'm not. He's willing to forgive me, and only he can. And why not? And went home that night, and because uh, I was confused. It's, it's kind of radical going from a total radical pagan to saying with my mouth that. So it wasn't like a slow process. Um, I was like, oh, Lord, I, I don't know what I really did tonight, but something's changed. And and if you're if this is real, I just want you to know I am opening the door of my heart because Revelation says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if you'll let me in, I'll come in with you and sup with you and you with me. I, I, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm, I'm opening. As crazy as that sounds to hear from Kevin, that's what I'm doing. And he, he took over. The word is near you. All I had to do is confess it with my mouth. The word is near you, in your mouth, in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved, which is the meaning of Jesus. You, he came to save. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. You know, the world thinks we're shameful. They want to get rid of us. I don't care what the world considers shameful. I only care about what God considers shameful. And you know what's shameful to God? It's rejecting his son, Jesus. And so if you believe in him and confess him, you will not be put to shame on judgment day. He will say, come, to, come into my kingdom as a child of God, an adopted child of God, because I gave you a right to become a child of God because you received my son, Jesus. Um, so here's the challenge to everybody is if you have confessed Jesus, the biblical Jesus, not the kill the Romans Jesus, the give me a girlfriend Jesus, give me a boyfriend Jesus, get, you know, make me rich Jesus, all the other Jesuses that are out there, not that Jesus, that you've confessed with your mouth, Jesus save me from sin. I'm on my way to hell. If you've confessed with your mouth, the Lord Jesus and believed in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, meaning he's going to keep his promise to give you everlasting life, you're saved. If you have never, with your mouth, confessed Jesus as your Savior, then today's an opportunity to do it. And you could just stand up right now and say, Kevin, I want to confess Jesus in front of all these people. I want to confess that Jesus... I need Jesus because I need a Savior, and his name means God saves. And that's what he told Mary. His name was going to be Jesus and what was prophesied, and you know what? I don't want to be lost in my trespasses and sins for all of eternity. What good is a little bit of lust and pleasure in this world when I reject the God who came to save me? So, so let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, just the joy of being able to really realize that Jesus is the reason for the season. Help us in everything that happens in the next couple of days with our family to never forget that you gave the greatest gift of all, a gift that lasts forever. And you gave us the right to be called children of God, a right that will never, ever be taken away. And that because of that, Lord, we so love you and we so thank you for your kindness to us, and that you so loved us, you sent Jesus to die on the cross for us. In Jesus' name, amen.